Yeah. So, let's yes. go. Let's go. <coughs> Eu vou pôr essa parte, tá? Good morning, UX! Yeah, we are here again with you. Yeah, yeah. We come back. We come back with your amazing English. Amazing. Oh, uh, over, over one or two years? Uh, one year. One year. Yeah, we have a gap. Over a, a year. one year gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I hope that our English could improve a little bit in this yeah, middle yeah. time. I don't know, I don't know. We can see some good. comments not so good in our video. Yeah, but... yeah, 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 yeah. But okay, that's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. You have this. Yeah. You have yeah. to accept that. So I'm I don't so care. sorry. I don't care. <laughs> Because it's fun for us. It's no, it's part. Of... It's part of our journey learning English. Yeah, exactly. To, to, to understand here, because we yeah. we don't care. We need don't care a little bit. But uh, it's yeah. a, a great material for our English teacher out there. So yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. captured that and okay, guys. Oh, let's come back. Yeah, <laughs> we usually use this uh, subject or this content for our class. It's a good thing for us. Also, yeah, yeah. It's not just for that. Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, we we enjoy to to use for our English. Yeah, class. if if you are if you are um, arriving now here, it's in, you don't uh, uh, know us. Probably you will not understand that. But we started this uh, this challenge to 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 talk with uh, non-Brazilian people or English speakers. Um, Two or three years ago, I suppose so. Two years ago. Two was, years yeah, ago. because yeah, started, it was uh, when I when moved to, to Porto. Yeah. was the, the first one. Yeah, yeah. And it was a challenge for us. Challenge to, totally. to yeah. practice our English. And we like to chat too. And <laughs> because that we kind of, uh, I don't know, still here. <laughs> yeah, it is a mix of feelings. And, uh, and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. And uh, we are here with you, and we interview a lot of people. I don't know if you follow us, but uh, we have the achieve the high level of. <laughs> yeah, because I think we, for us, for Rodrigo and I, it is a win-win because we are learning English or improving our English, and we are learning more about design, about 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 the industry too. And, and we had my chance. mind is always blowing. Yeah, and we have a Blowing chance up. and had a chance to speak with amazing people around the world, yeah. authors, yeah. reference, gods. And, and today <laughs> we come today. back to talk with another great yeah. author of a, a, yes. not just a one book, five books, I suppose. So yeah, five or yeah, yeah, like that. yeah, 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 yeah. Will be a of great them. experience to speak with him, Mr. Moore. Alan yeah, Moore is not Alan the Moore. same. Yeah, it is. Let it's me be clear here. I, I do ask him, but it's not the same from v, the Vendetta, uh, yeah. Watchmen. No, it's uh, another yeah, Alan Moore. You, you can say, oh, yeah, we are talking with Alan Moore. No. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not day. unfortunately, because this Alan Moore is very good too, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, But uh, just to align expectation, it's not <laughs> yeah, the same yeah. Alan Moore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someday, I don't know, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Yeah, yeah, he he is not able to 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 go to interviews <laughs> anymore. But okay, but this Alan Moore is here with us. It's yes. an amazing guy, author, uh, with amazing project. So let's talk with a great right designer. Now. Great designer. Let's talk with Alan Moore. So, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, it's, al it's al always a pleasure to have the opportunity to meet and speak with someone like you, who is a reference point for us. So, thank you very much, Mr. Alan Moore. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Oh, oh nice. And to start, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself, sharing a bit about your experience in life with your Brazilian audience. Could you? 
Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, I started off life as a as a typographer and book designer, uh, graphic designer. Uh, I've worked as an artist um, in photography and printmaking. Um, I write, um, and then in my commercial life, uh, I was. Um, working in design i worked around the world i worked in advertising um uh, because of my age i say i'm uh, i'm fully analog pre-digital uh, and so i grew up in a very different uh, world in many respects but was witness to uh, the transformation uh from that analog world to the digital world um and for quite a long period of time then we worked with lots of companies and helping them understand um how digital was going to kind of play a very big role in their lives uh, we help digital companies think about the products and services they can kind of create um and that was uh that was all great and i got to travel the world um got to write some books um and um that was kind of a bit of a sideline to to begin with um but uh, I increasingly became concerned about the state of the world that we were in and the economies and things that uh, we were running. And so I decided that I could no longer um, you know, work in the capacity I was and I wanted to put my energy and efforts into um, this idea around beauty and um, you know, how to design and create a better world as a consequence of, of that. So I've ended up writing about four books the last two are probably the most relevant. So do design, beauty is key to everything, and do build how to make and lead a business the world needs, um, which are not available in Portuguese, but they are available in Spanish, um, if that's of any use to your to your readers. Great, great. Wow. A huge experience and life. And, mm. uh, and we will put the link of your book in Amazon right here in the description of yep. this video. Mm -hmm. And for our audience, uh, and please, uh, I'm sorry, do people confuse you with the uh, other Alan Moore sometimes? <laughs> Not anymore, but uh, there's two oh. funny stories. One is, is um, it was actually quite a few years ago, and I was at South by Southwest, uh, the festival uh, in America, and um, I was with a friend of mine who was a, a professor at MIT, and he introduced me to this other chap and he said, this is my friend Alan Moore. And the other guy said, um, so what's it like to live under the shadow of Alan Moore? And I said, well, I don't know. You'll have to ask him that question. Um, so I always used to tease him after that saying, I'm the other Alan Moore. Um, there was one occasion when um, I was giving a talk and uh, my daughter was with me actually. And um, people were sort of coming into the auditorium and uh, she said to me, she said, Dad, she said, I think that um, there's some folks in here that think you are the other Alan Moore. So I kind of stood up and I said, you know, thank you very much for all coming and to be here and uh, et cetera. But I said, there's, you know, a bit of kind of, uh, you know, some house rules here or um, something we need to clear up. Because there are a bunch of people that are turned up with Alan Moore comics. Um, so I said, if you think that you've come to watch Alan Moore speak about his life in comic book writing, uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and Vias for Vendetta. I'm not that guy. So to save anyone embarrassment, uh, you know, if you all want to leave now, that'll be fine. So yeah, there was about, I don't know, a dozen dozen young teenagers or younger adults got up and left, bitterly disappointed that Alan Moore was not going to be signing their uh, comic books. But um, so there you go. There are my two stories about the other Alan Moore. <laughs> Wow, great, great history! <laughs> I, I can I imagine that. Yeah, that I can manage some someone bring the the, the Watchmen book or something uh, book to, to sign. sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is your bird? What is your hat? <laughs> well, no, exactly. We look the same. We're not separated at birth. Uh, that's for sure. You know, um, as we say in English. Great. Amazing, amazing! Thank you to share that with us, <laughs> and. Uh, but talking about share another thing about your project uh can you share more about the journey and inspiration behind 
co-founding the beautiful design project with Tingeus, steaming yeah. from your books, do design and do build, please. Yeah. Um, well, I can talk about the inspiration for writing do design because that kind of leads into other things if that's relevant for you guys. Um, uh, I kind of got to a point in my life where, as I said, I felt very disillusioned with what was kind of happening um, and the work that I was doing. And I asked myself, you know, I no longer want to be in this kind of world of innovation and marketing and, you know, designing and the way that I was being asked to do because it really didn't seem to be so purpose. Um, and so I asked myself, what takes me home? And home is in here. This is where your home is. Um, and so I sat with intention for quite some time, which was what takes me home. And I have a, a childhood memory, which I'd never had before, uh, where I'm a seven-year-old boy on a family holiday on a beach in Cornwall. And um, my mum was there, my dad, my brother and sister. Um, my mum was always a very anxious woman. And when she got anxious, it made me very anxious. Um, and there was all sorts of reasons for that. And sometimes we had a bit of a complicated relationship, but she was an amazing woman um, and very strong in many ways. Um, but she was on the beach and she was in a skirt and a jumper and you know, bare legs and was playful, happy. And it kind of gave me a lot, of, a lot of joy to watch her as happy as that. And then I thought about my father who was wartime educated. So he, he left school at 14. Um, he was profoundly dyslexic. Um, never earned a lot of money in his life, but he, um, my um, mother and my father had this incredible uh, partnership, uh, which lasted for well over 50 years. Um, so there was no patriarch in our house. It was like, they were like this team. Um, and I thought about that wonderful relationship that they had. I thought about my brother and my sister um, and how much I loved them. And then I thought about myself um, playing uh, in those days with my long blonde platinum hair, which obviously is gone now. Um, um, and I thought I'm at one with those I love the most. I'm at one with myself and I've not always been at one with myself, uh, which has been part of the journey that I've been on. Um, and I'm at one with the natural world. We're on this beautiful, pristine beach. We've got, you know, the sea is twinkling like diamonds um, and then the sky is blue. And this incredible sense of synergy, both in terms of my external self and the world around me, um, the only word that could describe that was beauty. And that's how I sat down to write the book, uh, Why Beauty is Key to Everything. And at the end of that book, um, you know, I started to write about business being beautiful because I still believe that it's not politicians are the agents of change in this world, particularly at the moment. Um, I think it's business. And for me, business is the business of getting stuff done. Um, and I wanted to write about how we create that homecoming for ourselves in Do Design. Um, how do we reconnect ourselves to the natural world? How do we reconnect ourselves to our sacred selves and our spiritual selves? Um, you know, I'm not a religious person. Um, I would say, if anything, Buddhism is my guide. I have no problem if people believe in, you know, a, a higher order. But I do believe we will have a great sense of spirituality. Um, and actually, the world that we currently live in um, doesn't really feed that in the way it does. It needs to. I also wanted to then think about this the creative act of the designer and the creator and the maker um, and to return to this concept of craftsmanship um, because craftsmanship lives in the heart of being in service to the, a greater good and a wider community so if you think about ceramics you know pottery for example as soon as you've made a bowl for somebody you know that's for others to share in um, and it's a very deep connection to tool making and so this is a very important philosophy for me to say all of these things are important and all of these things need to be combined uh, with each other. So we, when we ask the question, what is it I'm going to make or how are we going to make it? What are the materials we're going to use? What is the legacy of this business or this product that we're going to we, we need to ask ourselves these profoundly deep questions. Um, 
so that was kind of really the genesis and the and the reason why I wrote the book. Um, and what was amazing was is two weeks after that book was published, uh, Miranda, my publisher, rang me up and she said, Alan, you've given me a real problem. And I said, Miranda, what's that? And she said, well, the book has sold out. And that was not in the business plan. Um, and we were a tiny, we're a tiny company. They're a tiny company, right? I mean, we're not penguin. There wasn't a massive marketing budget. And what it said to me was is, there was something in that book that was resonating for other people in, in the world. Um, and then there was a lot of love that came back. Um, lots of people emailed me, um, sent me things, notes, and just saying how much that book had helped them at a moment of transformation. And in many respects, I wrote that book for myself because I was at that crossroads of transformation. Um, <clears throat> And so I then sort of reflected on that. And of course, I wrote this other book a bit later called Do Build, How to Make Lead a Business the World Needs, which is kind of much more business oriented. But it's taking that overarching philosophy around beauty and all the things that beauty is kind of connected to. Um, and I suppose just to um, kind of caveat that for your audience here, just to be very clear, I say that nature has run the longest R&D project we've ever known. And she's created the conditions for all life to thrive without wasting a single atom. And if the laws of the universe are said to be beautiful, literally the mechanical laws that how our world works at a kind of infinite level and at the smallest level we can possibly imagine, um, then maybe um, we need to kind of work from nature's playbook. And her playbook is all about regeneration. It's not about sustainability. It's about actually creating those conditions for all life to thrive. And so in a way, the, I thought that that was important. And to sort of, uh, that's why I don't really like to talk about innovation uh, in that sense, um, or consultancy, because in a sense, we have to work with all of these things at the same time. So I designed this six part program um, off the back of the books um, or based around the books um, as we were going into COVID. Uh, and that was a sort of a program which kind of we talk about the reset. So three three modules that really kind of get into the topics that I've just explained and, and touched upon and then moving people into what we call the doing which is actually where I move people into an applied space uh, with intention to, were I to design a business that was more beautiful, what would that look like? Um, uh, so these two things are very, very important. Um, Tim actually was one of the guys that uh, came on one of the first programs that we ran. Um, and um, we started to, I, I really liked him. I thought he was a great guy. Um, he was great fun to work with. Um, and then over a period of time, he got in touch with me and he said, I think I'd really like to partner with you um, because I think actually you're already bringing something important into this into this world. Um, so that's how the beautiful, uh, you know, the beautiful uh, design project uh, was kind of born, um, where in fact, actually we are inviting people to you know participate or come on a journey um with programs that we run to help them maybe recalibrate how they see themselves see the the agency the actions that they could take in this world or it could in fact, in fact be an organization that is also sitting there thinking about um we really do need to think about transforming our business but you know to what end um, how we create legacy, um, how we going to be in service to the greater good. Um, and I don't think it can just be about making money uh, anymore because uh, the pursuit of profit at all at any cost has cost us a great deal as far as I'm concerned and what I see. Um, and it's back to that point that if we want to hang around for a bit longer as a species, then we have to rethink the nature of business um and how it operates in this in this world what we measure um what are the what are the value metrics that we would sort of um, we would use in terms of thinking about yeah that kind of more holistic approach to the nature of business and design um 
now and going forward into the future. There are a lot of points that we can explore. Yeah. It was amazing to understand your point of view and uh, the definition of beauty. Wow, it's mm. so amazing. Well, I, I don't know how to start. Would you share? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think uh, one of the the, the most uh, impacting things that I can brought from from this uh, is I I loved how you could uh, connect the the. The pragmatism of the business and the industry with this proposal to to reshape us as a professional. I suppose yes. uh, professionals. I suppose it it is the the, the mainly uh, goal of the project. Okay, we need to to prepare people for industry for businesses, but uh, uh, people reshaping themselves for for the better, not to just to make money or to to. Mm -hmm. To deliver what uh, the the company wants, but uh, what mm. they need to deliver for the companies, and I suppose it is the, the connection between this uh, uh, this uh, objective of the the project. Uh, I, I'm right. Am I right? Yeah, no, very much so. I mean, I, uh, if we return to the idea of craftsmanship, um, they, we talk about the craftsman or craftswoman, craftsperson. Um, it's the holy trinity of the hand, the heart, and the mind, and all three must be in play at the same time. And I think that um, I, I think that that is important. I think this idea of making our work feel more soulful, mm -hmm. uh, to put it in a, in, in a better sense. And if we if we can't reset ourselves, if we can't tap into that that kind of deeper creativity, which is really in our, in our, you know, in our deep selves, then really we're not operating from the right place uh, in terms of the work that we, we do. And I think there's a kind of, there's an ethical and there's a moral dimension to this, which is when you're thinking about bringing beautiful things into the world, in fact, that, you know, um, that they're there to be contributory um, rather than extractive, that mindset is, is actually affecting the way that people take and make decisions. I'll give you an example. Uh, I've got a friend of mine, um, and he uh, he's made a lot of money. Let's just say it. he's just made a lot of money. He's, he's found a way to run a consultancy, which is ultimately sold, um, and he sits in his very, very big house, um and you know he's really happy um um and i went to see him um about a year or so ago and you know he he'd read the books and um you know we had a nice catch up and a chat and um but then he said to me you know ali he said uh, you know i really i really kind of buy into what it is you're trying to do but why should i care um and I didn't say anything to him at the time. And I said, but you've got a five-year-old daughter. And if you don't understand that caring is about the legacy of her future, just because you're sitting in this massive house doesn't actually make you impervious to actually what is going to happen in the world. Um, uh, you know, if we think about climate change or food supplies or, you know, whatever it is may be. So I think that we have to care. And it's almost like, and that is in part the, the reason why I sort of walked away from conventional business. And even now it's like, you know, the conversation is, is how much money can you make us? How much money can you save us? How many people can we shed from the workforce? Um, and, and ultimately it becomes a zero sum game uh, because it's a very extractive model. Um, and if you then kind of put on top of that, the fact that, you know, uh, indigenous wisdom, um, whether it's in South America or whether it's in North America, Canada, in Australia, you know, these were folks that were hanging around for about 80,000 years before we came across them. Don't you think they've worked out a philosophy of how they tended to and looked after the land and the natural resources that they've got? Um, and yet we seem to want to be blind to that because in a sense, it's partly a political act which is we can take from those that are weaker 
and we can make ourselves wealthier as a consequence of, of that. Um, and to me, I think that needs to be challenged. Um, from the people that have put their hands up already around the beautiful design projects, and I've been talking to people constantly now from all around the world, um, there is a tribe out there um, which really wants a different world than the one we've currently got, and they're motivated by a very different set of values rather than the conventional wisdom. And there is actually also a mismatch, I think, between Gen Z um, and the organizations where these folks are turning up and they're saying, I'm not just interested in um, you know, the, the amount of money you're going to pay me. I'm interested in what type of world am I going to be creating if I'm working on this business? And so that is kind of, you know, you've got that, you've got that going on at the moment. Um, I think we're probably one of the few uh, people to kind of off the back of the books to kind of really bring those separate topics and ideas and ways of working together. Yes, you know, you've got leadership programs, you've got an innovation program, you've got design thinking program, customer journey program, you know, you can go and hang out in the Buddhist retreat or wherever it is, but they're all separate. And somehow or other, they do need to be unified to create a very different sense of potential. Um, how do you release the potential of someone in this world uh, in the most creative way that you possibly can? If you look at venture capital, for example, VC, you know, it, it wants to build companies and sell them within five to 10 years. That's not a regenerative mindset. Uh, scale is important, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, and what I've tried to do in uh, in in do build particularly um, is to gather a, a kind of a range of businesses, uh, large and small, which actually have the capacity to really think about that legacy and that regeneration. Um, how do you fund a regenerative business? So Climeworks, uh, which is a company I, I write about, um, which have built these machines that suck huge quantities of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then turn it into a material that can then be put into the ground and turned back to rock. Um, uh, you know, it's not the, we don't have a one, a one bullet solution to the, the climate challenges we got, but this is a great example. So they were told that their, their machines could never be built, which they did. And these guys are very clever. Um, they then were told that they wouldn't be able to find a business model that would work, which they did. Um, but the funny thing is, is all their money was raised privately because Jan, one of the founders, Jan Wurzbacher said to me, you cannot build a regenerative business in 10 years. You have to think in a very different timeline. So, and of course there's friction in that because current organizations, you might say, particularly if they're publicly traded and owned and all the rest of it are under huge pressure. Um, so transformation for them is a huge challenge. Um, but you saw it with the digital revolution where many, many businesses that were pre-digital um, weren't prepared to deal with the transformation that was coming their way. Kodak, for example, invented a digital camera, but they said, oh, we couldn't possibly bring that into the marketplace because it would destroy our business model. But to me, that's a form of myopia. And of course, every, you know, every, everything has its day, you might say, but I think there's a kind of way in terms of how we could think about this kind of transformative approach. Um, but it may well be that, you know, what we see coming up around the world are all sorts of businesses um, that, um, you know, Vaja, the um, sneaker brand, for example, you know, revolutionizing a way that you would think about um, a sneaker, um, where the raw materials come from, how they employ people, you know, every single aspect of their supply chain. And they say, we can do the cool thing and the right thing. It's not either or, it's and, and. Um, and I don't see any problem with that um, at all. I am interested in understanding from you, uh, in your opinion, what is the role of designers into this situation, this, this challenge, the, the professional designer? Because mm. we have, of course, uh, uh, a role into this uh, this uh, 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 all industry. But how can we uh, how we can uh, uh, make this difference? 
mm. uh, outside of the project, of course, in the in the day by day too. Yeah. Well, I mean, my view is is that everything man made in this world is designed, um, and uh, there's a point where it does exist, and then it has to be imagined. Uh, you have to think about how you're going to bring that into the world. And so I, in a way, I challenge that. And I say we're all designers, uh, which is why we call it the Beautiful Business Designer Program. Um, and of course, there are, you know, there's, so we, I, I think about it as D is the big D of design. Um, yes, you need specialists within that, um, for sure. So mechanical engineers, industrial designers, UX designers, um, I think it's about um, if you're not happy in the work that you're doing. So I was talking to someone yesterday um, who was actually be asking the question about, you know, how their business maybe could address sustainability from a design perspective in a, in a different type of way. And I suppose you might say on the one hand where you need to start the conversation um, in terms of what that role of design could be. Um, do you find a side project which you can contribute to that would maybe kind of reward you in different types of ways? Um, I also see that people are desperate for community and they're desperate for a network of people where they can connect to. So as is ever the case, you know, a lot of people are stuck in jobs that they've got because they've got to pay the rent um, you know, and they've got to put food on the table, uh, all of that kind of stuff. But it's actually, it's not fulfilling them as people and they feel that there's something missing. Um, and so it's one of the things that also we're very keen to do is to build that that community and that network sort of, you know, over the next uh, year or two. So people can find each other and maybe it becomes a movement. And then now out of that, all sorts of other wonderful things can, can happen. Um, mm. I mean, I think that, uh, of course, they're teaching sustainable design in various, you know, schools and colleges around the world now and all the rest of it. Um, but can we go further? I think we can in terms of um, what we teach and how we teach it. Who do we expose people to? You know, um, so on the on the courses and the programs we run, we run, you know, we're introducing people to, uh, you know, prize winning physicists. So if you want to know about, it's not good enough for me to say, you know, my little story about, you know, the mechanics of the universe. Actually, you really need to learn, learn from someone who really knows, uh, you know, what it is they're talking about, or someone that has a, is an expert in indigenous wisdom to be exposed to designers and architects and makers, uh, all of which in their own way have been pioneers uh, in the work that they, that they do. Um, indigenous wisdom, you know, I'm not sure indigenous wisdom is taught um, on many design course programs or whatever, but it is about that kind of practice and that process of bringing those things in. And that's what we're very keen to try and do to enrich that experience for people and to say, well, there is another way I can be doing things. Um, and so that's the way that I see that. It's, it's, it's isn't uh, uh, about to quit your job, just quit. Oh my God, I don't like what I, I do now. I will quit, like we are seeing <laughs> in the in the industry. But to understand that, okay, I can keep my job and doing more, doing more in other opportunities for the community, for the world. And maybe we can, in a kind of time, uh, uh, quit our job, yes, but... Uh, uh, yeah. It's not uh, necessary, just necessary. No, I mean, I think that um, that learning process about what design could really mm. be and mean, what role that you could play, um, broadening and deepening that knowledge and that practice is uh, um, very important. And yes, I mean, you know, it's not wise just to quit your job. Um, you know, it's like where else could go? Oh, I like pro value to, as you said. Um, um, and um, and perhaps, you know, by evolving and developing the stories that I tell, actually. I mean, that's one of the things that I know that uh, when I work with people um, or if I'm giving a talk even, it's like I'm not to people up here. 
I need to speak to their hearts because nothing changes unless you change your belief about the world, you know, and, and that is actually the most important thing that you can do in some respects. And then being able to bring those, those then those compelling, you know, stories into um, the, the world, for others to hear and listen to and understand. It's like once you know, you can't unknow, and once you've seen, you can't unsee. Um, and so it's a question of what is held in what we call the narrative frame. Um, if you think about it from a, say, a sociological perspective, business perspective, political perspective, then you, know, uh, you will know from your own experience, from your own countries, you know, people holding a narrative frame, which means then that other questions or conversations are being held out as a consequence of that. Um, and we have to change the narrative frame. Designers need to change the narrative frame about what is in that in that frame that these are key things that we need to be addressing and to be thinking about um and that to me i think is is absolutely essential you brought a lot of uh, tips but i like to know if you can bring more steps or practice you recommend for individuals or teams to be able to incorporate beauty into their designs can you bring more for us about that and i'm really going deeper into the um into that question and i think there's a lot of material out there that you can find um i mean obviously i've covered a lot of it uh, in i'm not the only one but we've covered stuff in the books that i've that i've written um we do actually run a newsletter uh which you can find on the beautiful business website which are pretty comprehensive um which are you know stimulating uh offering up you know what is beauty so well it's about the process of say an artist or you know how do we use art to you know think about the world in a different way um if things are beautifully made what does that look like and having the knowledge that you know you could look at say a ceramicist a digital company uh, Uh, a manufacturing company you know we, we we find a lot of material and um and freely share it uh and that's the way where you start to understand that beauty can manifest itself in different ways um you know we 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 put in books to read uh there's a bit in there around leadership and you know they push the envelope really in terms of um what is beautiful leadership what is generosity Uh, what does that look like? Um, and so I sort of really getting involved in that in those questions um, and going on that learning journey um, uh, to me is is the best thing that they could could do. And maybe it's you know having discussions then with their colleagues about well what does that mean? What have you found that is is beautiful? Um, one of the things that I do when uh, I, I I run a program. Uh, Uh, whether it's the, the long form formats or whether the one day thing is, I ask someone to bring something they believe to be beautiful. And I say it can be anything. Um, and it always makes people really uncomfortable because, on the one hand, they take it very seriously, um, but it's still kind of like, what is that? And, um, and then we ask people just to talk for about five minutes about why this thing is beautiful to them. And at the end of it, you know, I've made a list of things and I said, so you've talked about um, the periodic table, poetry, writing. Um, you've talked about the natural world. You've talked about design in a variety of different ways. You've talked about transformation from suffering. Uh, you talk about how an individual actually is kind of, you know, responding to the world or whatever. But actually now we have 20 things which you all brought. And actually, all of them are optimistic, um, and that shows you that that narrative framing then is extremely important. There's not a single negative idea in this room, and you filled it up only by me asking this very simple question, which is, "Show me something beautiful." Some people, it's a memory. You know? um, some people, it's an experience. Uh, it could be a piece of music, but people really get into it if there's a great. Uh, say by a very uh, well, 
a, a Greek uh, philosopher uh, called Plotinus, and he said, beauty is the only thing we know by instinct. It's not, it's not an idea. It, it, it lives in a different place. And I think that when you really turn up and you talk about beauty seriously, you know, I'm a 16 year old bloke and I'm white, right? Um, and, you know, I walk into a company and they say, what are you going to do with this today? And I say, well, I'm going to be helping your business about how it's going to be more beautiful. You know, sometimes people kind of, you know, get a bit uncomfortable about that because they think it's actually at a very superficial level. But actually, you can prove very quickly that it's not. And, and it takes you into a really different space than sustainability. So just to sort of touch on that, um, uh, a guy once said to me, um, uh, Alan, uh, what can um, the word the, or beauty give to the world of sustainability? And then he kind of folded his arms and thought that he kind of caught me out. And I said, well, I'm a musician and I can play what was sustaining on my guitar. But the reality is that I can't sustain that note forever. And I said, as a metaphor, I feel like I'm holding up the roof with those that I love the most underneath it. I'm in a very stressed position and I not, will not be able to sustain that position forever. And I said, what you've done is you've actually taken away all of the things that make our world worth living in as human beings. You've taken away the word joy. You've taken away the word color. Um, you've taken away the word transcendence, spirituality, the sacredness of our, of our world. You, know, um, you, you, you don't talk about that this beauty gives us a much broader canvas, a written way of describing it. And in the example of showing me something beautiful, it just reveals itself very, very clearly. And I said the problem with sustainability is also it's a it's a construct. Um, and it's difficult for sometimes for people to understand what that really means. And also it comes from a very moral framework, which is you've got to stop doing this stuff. And actually, it's not about stop doing that stuff. We just have to do it in a different way, which is actually kinder to people, the societies we serve, communities we serve, uh, and then that planet that we live on. Um, and and we it goes back to that kind of narrative bit as well, which is like do design particularly. Uh, I wrote it with a very clear intention that there would not be a negative idea in that book. And that book is not a happy, clappy book, as I would say in English, but it carries with it a quiet optimism of possibility and potential. Um, and it takes people on a bit of a journey in terms of what that may look like. And so for me, we have to, and go back to then the question about design, is we have to create a narrative which is optimistic that people feel is viable and relatable to. They can relate to that, that, that possibility. And it's something that they can participate in. Um, you know, there's lots of people out there that like to show how clever they are uh, in their research or kind of whatever, right? But actually, their heart is not open to bring other people into their world. And we have to create the biggest doorway and the biggest pathway we can for people to want to cross over to the other side to say, yes, I want to be part of building that cathedral or whatever it is and that I can participate and that I have agency in that because it's all very meaningful to me. And so that meaning making bit is absolutely critical, I think. Yeah, I think I now I can I. I I can uh, understand how you use the spiritual things for describe that because it's more to to avoid the the usual pragmatic uh, way to do things and to explore more the sense and the other ways and how we can touch people how we can bring people for for this not just to sell something or deliver something it's more deep. It's deeper than we usually yeah. Uh, do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, um, there's a story I tell, which is what I call the poetic brief. And um, so when I was a young man, uh, I was looking for a very big contemporary in London. And um, I mean, I worked with some amazing artists. Uh, I worked with Anthony Fever and Richard Long. 
uh, amongst others. And there was this show coming up with a gentleman called Cecil Collins, who was very famous, very old. Um, and his paintings were very spiritual and quite small. And um, the, the owner of the gallery said to me, Alan, he said, now, Cecil's work, I think they feel like jewels. Do you think you could design a catalogue like a jewel for me? And I was, what, about 24 or something. And I said, yes, Anthony, I can do that. And I did actually go away and I really pondered on that brief. Um, I thought, well, what is a jewel? A jewel is a, it's, it's a gift, it's a surprise, it's sensual, it's tactile. Um, it brings joy to other people. Uh, it may be given away to, to others. Uh, there's a sensuality about it. Um, and so interrogating this idea of what is a jewel, and of course it's, you know, there's no finite definition to that. But out of that, I decided like the, the format of the catalogue, the paper, the printing, who was going to print it, how it would be down, what cover would look like, everything. Right? That was, I was thinking like, how do I have this jewel? Uh, the five of you, um, Cecil comes up to me and he's uh, um, you are more. I said, I am. Um, and he said, I'm Cecil. And I said, yes, I know. He said, you designed the catalogue, didn't you? And I said, I did. He said, I have to tell you, it's the most beautiful catalogue anyone has ever designed for me. And he would have had a few designs in his life. And I think he was about 92 at the time. So when I'm teaching people, I say there's two briefs. The rational brief, there's the poetic brief. So we kind of know the constraints around things in terms of supply chain materials, you know, whatever that we're doing. But there's this other bit that we can reach for, which is also then about the kind of experience that we would want to create for people. Thank you very much for this incredible class on what is what, what beauty, beauty is about life, about business, and sharing a little of your experience with us in this fast moment so thank you so much for that amazing amazing okay you're more than welcome I, I, yeah, thanks for thanks for thanks for brought us this kind of uh um thoughts and and, and discussions yeah. because it's very important for us but uh, as a professional yeah. but uh as you said for the world too for the yeah, for the exactly the the the, the earth <laughs> i can say yeah indeed indeed and one last question. Where can our audience find out about your projects and books? Um, well, there's the, um, you can go to Amazon. Um, and, and there's also uh, the beautifuldesignproject.com, uh, which is a very simple uh, page at the moment. Uh, we're putting some more material together, but we ask people to be in touch with us if they'd like to know more. Um, and then we can follow up with that. If you want to know a bit more about me, um, there's beautiful.business, uh, which is my own website, which has got newsletter all there at the moment, uh, videos and interviews, um, uh, the CEO guide to creating a beautiful business, which is free to download. Um, so they're the kind of materials. You can also go to the Do Book Company website, um, but they're based in the UK. Um, but you can see a bit more information there, but probably Amazon in Brazil would be the easiest place to, you know, get hold of the books if you're if you're interested. Great. Everything will be written here in the video description so you can access and know more about this amazing project, work, book and everything. So again, Alan, thanks so much for your time. And I will invite you to come back and sometime yeah. again please sure anytime yeah it's a pleasure thank you so much wow such a great conversation yeah yeah it's that very I, I, like i said i'm speechless i i, I don't know <laughs> i don't know yeah i think uh it's another good conversation and very very spiritual spiritual i don't know what I don't know. I forgot the word. Uh, in Portuguese? No, I forget. Forget. It was very, very good conversation. In a high and... level of, of, of thought. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Inspirational. This is the word. Inspirational. 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 Oh, very, inspir very inspirational. Inspirational. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is a different kind, different way that we we went through about design, about uh, legacy, about beauty. And yeah. I think Alan Moore brought uh, something yeah. provocative. Right. And it is important to say, I suppose, so for our audience, it's important to understand that this kind of conversation is to be um, uh, uh, needs a, a kind of time to to, to yeah to, to yeah. think and to understand and to to use in your in our in our lives. It's not a okay. It's a practical thing to do tomorrow. It's, isn't true. Isn't true. Yeah. But yeah. it's very important to to create more wildly mind so yeah. to see more than the, the just the design today day, day to day it's a important conversation and this is something to digest mm -hmm. right yeah yeah this is yeah way. yeah yeah it's not just okay i will do something right now no i i think you have to digest think more yeah uh it's almost philosophy But it's not. Maybe, yeah, maybe read more, yeah, listen more. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it was amazing lessons for us about life. I, I, I love when he he described about Beach and his family. Whoa, amazing that. Yeah. So yeah. I think everything is connected. So I hope that this conversation was tremendous for you. Yeah, it can be. To bring you. more. Uh, let's think about it. In the future, my position, what I do day to day, like Burichi said. So I think everything is here. Yeah, yeah. And we come back, as we said in the beginning. Probably you are seeing this. I don't know if it will be the, the first video. <laughs> we are not sure about that. But uh, uh, you can follow us and see the other videos. Watch the other videos. Yeah. I don't the know, one month, two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, the video cast will be cut. It. Oh, you, yeah. you can watch in pieces in your YouTube, but the podcast mm -hmm. will be there entire. So you oh can, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you can use that uh, and and see all conversations. So we will uh, change our our strategy to yes. share. Good Because morning, in, in video you, you you can watch uh, with subtitles. To, to learn more, uh -huh. and, but in the podcast, just in the English audio. Yeah. It's more yeah. difficult. Good, It's a good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good <laughs> luck. We are here. We, we, yeah, we are here for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And please share your thoughts. Share yeah, your yeah. Give, give, your, give us your feedback. Yeah. Give share us your share this content. Share it with share your friend, your leader your colleague i don't know who you think uh, is important to share yes, exactly and that's it see that's you it. on the next episode of good morning ux and another videos in portuguese and podcasts in portuguese here in design yeah. team that's it yeah yeah that's it see you see you bye bye